And so, as you probably know, the federal government will be raising your monthly Medicare Part B, as in boy, premiums next year. Uh, and uh, certainly a lot of it related to the pandemic and what it calls uncertainty of how, how much there might be, uh, have to, one has to pay for a pricey new drug uh, dealing with Alzheimer's. And uh, the increase is far more than the trustees originally estimated in their annual report back in August. And so how will this increase impact your family? Uh, on the show today, Paul Seiger, who is a managing partner with PCS Advisors, a health benefits consulting firm with 35 partner offices across the United States. Paul, uh, thanks so much for coming on. You know, we've been reading about this Alzheimer's drug. We've been reading about Medicare Part B as in boy, not to be confused with B. Um, and uh, it's uh, part of the you know, fee-for-service type uh, model here. So talk us through us, just briefly summarize, why is the premium for Part B going up so much and uh, about how much is it going up? Yeah, it's going up about double what was projected. It has historically gone up quicker than the cost of living allowance increases. Yeah. Uh, very similar to the fact that employer-sponsored plans, employees have seen payroll deductions grow more quickly than wage increases. So that has been the trend. This is more severe. It's about double what was projected, 14.5% versus the 7 that they uh, projected just a couple of months ago. Yeah. And as you pointed out, this newly approved June of this year Alzheimer's drug around which there's quite a bit of question and controversy. It's an interesting story in and of itself. That is being used as a large part of the justification for this increase, even though they are not currently covering the cost of this drug. Yeah, yeah. And for our listeners, you know, by law, Part B, as in boy, uh, the monthly premium must cover 25% of the estimated total Part B cost for enrollees age 65 and above, the rest comes from general revenue. And so as a result, the trustees that run the program have to do this projection about what costs will be. And this Alzheimer's drug is contributing uh, uh, to, to that. Um, and so how much of this outside of all, I mean, if they really kind of broken it down, I, don't, I, I didn't recall seeing that, how much is driven by this new drug that, you know, a lot of debate about the efficacy of it and, and so right. forth uh, versus kind of the, if we took out the drug, um, how much uh, cost would be going up? Yeah, we they didn't release those numbers, but if we look at the overall market, the yeah. insurers in general were, are coming off of what has been a very good time, actually, because of all the lockdowns related to COVID, people were not right. able to seek care. So claims to the system as a whole were down 70%. Mm -hmm. So when we've seen insurers in general, including now Medicare with this Part B, come out with what have been fairly consistently outsized increases across the market, we've really, we are really questioning that. Uh, I mean, they had, they've had cash literally piling up on them throughout the pandemic. And we're posting the for-profit insurers are posting double the quarterly profits over quarters prior to the same quarters prior to the pandemic. Yeah. So I think a lot of this is being attributed to the potential impact of this Alzheimer's drug, which has, you know, all the part B total outpatient Medicare drug spending in 2019 was 136 billion. And just to put it in perspective with this drug, we have 6 million people with Alzheimer's. It's, They've said that the price tag for this for one person is fifty six thousand, but that's actually a dosage that is below the average weight of a person, and there's some other factors that go into the yeah. testing you would need to have. So it's really more like a hundred thousand dollar a year price tag per person. Yeah. So it has the potential to be a massive uh, hit to the system in terms of cost. If we had one in six Alzheimer's patients prescribe this drug, it, it would be a hundred billion dollar hit to the system when all drugs were 136 in 19. So it's, it is a serious storm cloud potentially. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's a big increase. You know, some of that of course is also part D as well, but certainly yeah, I completely agree with you that it is. And one of the things that people don't always realize with Medicare is that putting the, the even aside the issue of you know, negotiated prices and so forth, that's a whole other debate that is going on right now. Um, but it is also, they just, they basically can't say no and say, this doesn't meet the efficacy 
kind right. of guidelines that a private insurer may be uh, willing to do. And so um, you often see very minor innovations for this kind of big spender, the biggest payer in the United States. Um, often driving the market and it's, you know, it's kind of dumb money. And so, you know, they take as they know. Um, That's and, right. You know, as a result of that, the even minor innovations often get um, a price a lot. Um, and so let's talk about this, you know, break it down by kind of income levels. I mean, for some people, you know, especially they're not Medicare Advantage or on traditional fee-for-service and um, so forth. They think, you know, Part B premiums are not, you know, yes, on one hand, it's an amazing deal because you're only paying about one, you know, quarter of every dollar of actual spending. Now, on the hand, it's still, you know, uh, you know, a pretty it's 14 percent increase, and that is going to have some impact. Well, yeah, and they're they are getting a very large cost of living adjustment. Yeah, through Social Security. In the biggest in yeah. three years through Social Security, but yeah. uh, when you factor in other inflation that's that exists in the economy, I think we're going to end up at a place in terms of real dollars where we are at a deficit again, mm-hmm. uh, and it's going to be between the fourteen and a half percent, which will take that one hundred and forty-eight dollar and fifty cent premium to one seventy ten one hundred and seventy and ten cents. They they're coming out. The, in saying, hey, you're going to have a net gain of $70 because of our COLA on the Social Security side. But I think a lot, in real terms, a lot of that will get eaten up, unfortunately, by other factors in the economy. Yeah, and I think there's a lot of heterogeneity there. So it's true that, you know, 6%, 5.9% COLA on Social Security, because that's your entire Social Security check, and only part of that would be devoted to, you know, Medicare uh, Part B. And so 14% on a much smaller base. Is mm-hmm. still could net out, of course, that uh, overall people are getting um, more dollars. But what a lot of people don't realize is the COLA and Social Security is there precisely because lots of prices are going up, not just That's this right. one thing. That's and right. So net net, you know, it is, and there's even a debate whether that's even the right cola we should be using for Social Security, precisely right. for this reason. By the way, they're using the general cola across the population and not for older people who tend to have more healthcare expenses. So let's talk, you know, we don't try to, I try to avoid politics like the plague, uh, given my work on the policy uh, center. But nonetheless, this, this approval of this drug could have some precedent. I mean, I'm just kind of thinking through, you know, some of the, you're an inside player in this industry and so forth. Do you think that this Alzheimer's drug is going to open up the door for lots of drugs with, you know, efficacy that maybe is, you know, People have debates about it, but they also come with big price tags. I do. I, th- I think it's the biggest storm cloud that's on the horizon for our healthcare mm-hmm. system as a whole. Are these drugs where, on the one hand, I mean, you can understand the emotional energy behind wanting a solution for something oh, as horrible sure. as Alzheimer's yeah. that affects six million people? Uh, but when we look at the, the what happened here, you had eleven scientists that give their opinion to the FDA as to whether they should approve a drug. In this case, 10 said no, one said I'm not sure that it's inconclusive, and they approved it. And, in fact, the drug company, Biogen, that created the drug had two trials. And historically, to answer your question, historically for a drug like this, they would need to see two positive studies that showed that there was some efficacy. In this case, Biogen discontinued two studies because, in their own opinion, they, they weren't going well. And then six, seven months later, they have had to take another look at the data, uh, according to their own reporting, and decided maybe there was something here. And then it gets approved. Very unusual step taken by the FDA, to, the head of the FDA, to ask for an investigation into irregular interactions between employees at the manufacturer and the FDA that were not on the record and, and so on. So there's, there's mm. questions around it, most certainly. And when you look at how the, the rest of the market has responded, the VA, several Blue Cross Blue Shield companies around the country, uh, Cleveland Clinic, Mount Sinai in New York, some very respected institutions have said – Regardless of the FDA's approval, in this case, we are not going to uh, use this until there is further research to yeah. show that it is effective. Because there's at this point, it has not been shown to be effective in either slowing the development of Alzheimer's or curing it. And this is a, a very significant price tag for something that, while we realize people need hope, 
that's a that's a massive price tag for something that they are then giving nine years for a confirmatory trial. Yeah, and those are very prestigious places, Clinton Clinic and so forth. And let's you know, I think drug companies get bashed way too much because I mean I what they're doing is incredibly high risk. You know, we used to say yes. twenty, thirty years ago, one in ten drugs will make it and therefore you need a hundred billion dollar, you know, addressable market to do the to, to do the research and so forth. Now <laughs> one in ten would be awesome. I mean right. now right. we need a you know billion dollar addressable markets. I mean right. so how do you think you know so on one hand, I mean is as I always tell people, it's always easy to talk about drugs once it's developed and say, hey, I should get it cheaper. Try to figure out how to rewind in time and ask yourself, you know, I suppose that drug did not exist. And, exactly. you know, and it, it really is, you know, again, I think the drug companies take too much. Uh, they get vilified. Uh, they get vilified for no good reason. Yeah. yeah it's unjustified. But, I totally agree. Yeah. Yeah. And so it, it's one of these things that at the same time, there has to be this balance when you got Medicare, who is, you know, um, you can't make basically a lot of these uh, once the drug is approved, they're pretty much on the hook for, pay, for, for paying it. What do you see is kind of going forward? I mean, to you know, the, the share of the cost of these drugs to individuals. Let's talk about that first. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. If someone needs the Alzheimer's drug. You said realis- realistically, it's probably a hundred grand for you know uh, a treatment so far a proper full treatment. So, how much of that would they bear um, under on their Medicare? $11,500 is their potential yeah. out-of-pocket cost. So it's very significant for them as well, especially when you consider that the average income for one of these enrollees is, twenty, I believe, 28000 and change. So it's a significant uh, investment for them also. Yeah. And then how many times were they – how many treatments are they, they going to need? Um, how many are, are we talking about I'm going? Um, well, this is still unknown. Time? Yeah. yeah. I say, because at the same time, you know, they at that point in life, they should have some assets saved up and, and so forth. But nonetheless, you're absolutely right that a lot of people don't. And so that's going to be uh, very, uh, very challenging for the, them to come up with it, even under Medicare. And there will certainly be pressures to, right. uh, there. So when you think about drugs, um, you know, any last thoughts about going for Medicare? As we know, Medicare shortfalls already you know, are, are significant as our Social Security uh, over the next 7,500 years and so forth. So what do you think is, you know, um, the, the way I to think go? there are here? solutions. Yeah, 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 we have a yeah. path forward that I think does give me some optimism because mm-hmm. I, I really loved your point earlier about the fact that we very commonly in our conversation publicly, we vilify drug companies, drug manufacturers, and that's not where the waste is in our system. We do have yeah. a significant amount of waste that's adding to the cost. If you look at the cost of this Alzheimer's drug, 30 to 60 percent of that will be uh, in the form of rebates that are captured by pharmacy benefit managers. And the original intent of those pharmacy benefit managers was that they would advocate on behalf of medic payers like Medicare and insurers to get the lowest price possible that they could in the marketplace for these drugs. And there's a clear conflict there in the way that that's evolved, uh, where they're both supposed to be out there negotiating on Medicare's behalf and other payers, but also uh, they are essentially in the supply chain selling the drug to that payer. And it's led to an incredible amount of waste. And that's so somehow we don't talk about that a lot, even though it is the largest source of waste in getting drugs in people's hands in this country. And we can do something about that uh, with transparency, with the elimination of rebates, uh, allowing fair cash pricing of drugs and, and just putting in some common sense rules that would actually create a free market would be would be a very positive way forward where we could yeah. get these drugs. The drug companies could afford R and D, uh, and we could still so we could still get the development we need. Yeah, uh, no, that's a great question. It's it. very analogous to what we talk on this show a lot in terms of you know the financial industry is often is you know most of it's still commission based, and we right. don't we don't let those type of advisors on the show because I don't agree with it. 
Um, you know, I, I want simple, transparent, you know, 100% fiduciary, 100% right. of the time, the only. And so uh, what you're basically saying, there's, there's an analogy here in the drug market. There absolutely is. And that's yeah. one, one of the things we do on a daily basis when we're working with payers. Uh, large employer plans, as an example, is to uh, unravel that, bring transparency to that. And it's absolutely shocking to them when they realize that their drug spend, which is the most inflationary part of their overall health care spend, yeah. it's on track to be 50 plus percent of what most of us spend on health care or our plans spend on our behalf on health care. It, it is for many payers already. When they see that about half of that can be eliminated and is represented mm. by waste that isn't it's not going to real players in the supply chain. It's not making its way to the manufacturer. It's mm. not making its way to the wholesaler or the retailer. It's these other players, these pharmacy benefit managers that are adding um, so much waste into our system that it's pricing people out of getting drugs they need. And it's creating conversations like we're having today. That, and it truly is a threat to the system, and it's not necessary. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it's uh, fantastic. You know, it's... a. Uh, it's one of those issues that, you know, again, I try to avoid all the politics, but at the same time, man, this, this really does interact, you know, first order way of retirement security as well to they figure this out. And like you said, you know, we constantly have higher healthcare inflation relative to normal inflate, rest of inflation. And this one is even double that, at least for this upcoming year. Uh, so tell us finally a little bit about your company. Um, just a, a guy by a minute and a half here left. Sure. You guys yeah, PCS Advisors, we're a healthcare consulting firm. We work with payers. So we work with employers primarily who are have reached a point of frustration where they'd like to get more efficiency and transparency in this area. And we've been able to do it all around the country and show employers by bringing transparency to this, what has become one of their largest spins, that they can get better results in terms of quality outcomes for their employees and the amount of coverage they're able to provide while reducing their costs often by as much as half. Yeah, yeah. And people don't understand there's a lot of innovation that can be done there, everything from health savings accounts to that's a talk for another day to, you know, lots of other things of how uh what employers pay for and so forth. So Paul, uh great, uh, fantastic job. Thanks very much for coming down to the show and explain all this, you know, rather nuanced but again very important stuff uh to us. Thanks for having me. I enjoyed it. And you can find out more about Paul and his company, PCS Advisors. And that's advisors with an E, not the O, PCSAdvisors.com.